health, diet, fitness, lifestyle. You're listening to It's Your Health Radio. And here's your host, Lisa Davis. Hello and welcome to It's Your Health. According to FBI statistics in the 2011 National Gang Threat Assessment Guide, there has been a 40% increase in the national gang crisis going on in the United States. Now, of course, no community wants to admit it has a gang problem, but gangs are everywhere. And joining us now is Bobby Kipper. He's an ex-cop and founder of the National Center for the Prevention of Community Violence. And he is the co-author of No Colors, A Hundred Way to Stop Gangs from Taking Away Our Community. Bobby, welcome to It's Your Health. Well, thanks for having me today. I'm so glad to have you on the program. In the book you write, quote, both of us spent a quarter of a century living in the same town watching gangs slowly take over our city, a problem unacknowledged by the community for years. You talk a lot in the book, Bobby, about the strong element of denial, no matter who you're talking to and what community you are in. If you can talk about this. Well, I... I it's it's interesting as we we look at that increase that you just reported by the FBI. Yeah. That that the majority of that increase has occurred in suburban and rural communities across America. Uh, just the the types of communities that really um, don't want to talk about this problem. It's very difficult, you know, a, having a gang issue or admitting to a gang issue certainly does not sell real estate. We understand that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, to not acknowledge a gang issue and allow it to grow and continue to grow as these statistics are showing us, um, certainly has a, a really bad impact on community from schools to neighborhoods to even the business community. Um, it's, it's having an impact on communities that we never thought that we would see in America, and that's one of the reasons why we talk about denial. We try to, to sound an alarm that you can't just wish your way out of this issue, and, and that's really what the, the premise of the book is all about. Well, what's so great about the book is that it's so educational on so many levels. I love how you write, quote, this is not a police problem. It's not a city council problem. It's not a school problem. It is not a problem you can leave alone because it doesn't affect your neighborhood. It's a community problem, and if we leave it unaddressed, it will slowly collapse our community. It seems like everybody wants to say, well, it's not our problem. It's these people or it's those people or it's this, instead of t- you know taking it head on because it can be overwhelming. But what's so great about your book is that you talk about a lot of ways to take it on, and you talk Talk about some communities that have, for example, in San Jose, California, where actually where I'm from. Oh, great. Yeah, I grew up in San Jose. Uh, That's they super. have a, and it, I think it was the other one, Berkeley. If you can tell us what's on the positive side, what's going on, and then I'd love to talk about some of those hundred uh, ways to stop gangs from taking away our communities. Sure. You, uh, you mentioned, uh, of course, your hometown of San Jose, yeah. and there are like uh, communities across America that are actually cited in no colors. The interesting thing about the, the book is that what we have done is, is spent uh, several years researching, and, and what we're really proud of is that we stand on the, the fact that these are actually solutions that have been working in communities. Uh, San Jose, Richmond, Virginia, uh, Minneapolis are just to name a few of some of the the communities across America that have embraced the idea of everyone coming to the table, uh, not to make it a finger-pointing issue within the community. It's very easy to say, well, you know, this is a police problem, this is a law enforcement problem. But the communities that really have stepped up to the plate have, have really thought, beyond that. They really see this as a bigger a bigger picture and the fact that not only does it impact all areas of the community, but the solutions that we give um, take on all aspects of the community. An example would be um, years ago you would have never heard probably the faith-based community being front and center in this issue, but it now we, we have dialogue with communities across America to learn that those that, uh, areas that are successful really have a strong faith-based component to where churches are doing you know, more than just opening up their, their uh, sanctuaries. They're actually going out on the street and dialoguing with people in communities and putting their arms around you know, some of the angry young people who are possessing guns and having them to change their way of lifestyle. So the, the, the communities that are really based in solutions have really – Everybody's joined hands, and that's the key to what No Colors represents. It represents hope for communities because everyone begins to be part of the solution instead of really pointing to one issue to handle the problem. Yeah, and you talk about that the communities that are having any measure of success, they've deployed a community-wide effort, but it starts with a strategic plan. Tell us about that. Well, what 
typically has happened in the past, uh, as we move beyond law enforcement, if we look at the traditional role of addressing gangs within communities in America, typically we used it as a, a police problem where we would wait till somebody committed a serious crime, um, they were recruited into a gang, and then we would punish them through the justice system. The communities that actually have stepped up to the plate have, have not depended on programs. Uh, when we first started our addressing gangs in a in a really wholesome way in communities, we, we sort of threw programs at the problem. Uh, this program will will stop it. Uh, maybe you know more boys and girls clubs, which are are great organizations and communities. But maybe if we put all of our you know all of our emphasis on on those types of programs, maybe it would 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 change. But the interesting thing about the the gang issue is that the reason a, a strategy is needed is because not one program fits every community in this country. Mm-hmm. There are some communities that do not quite have the problem as other communities, and they need to really focus their efforts on prevention and early intervention when they learn that kids are joining gangs. So that would need to be a strategy that would be developed by that community, focusing on the idea, okay, we know that we now have a growing gang problem, but what we need to do is we need to develop a strategy. In No Colors, we actually give, um, you know, organizationally a strategy which we call the peer plan, Mm -hmm. which we originated uh, here in Virginia and tried it in several communities. It has a great impact. And and peer in the book stands for prevention, intervention, enforcement, and reentry. So each one of those individual areas will have a strategy to deploy with the individual area. That together will make a strategic plan for a community. Oh, that's great. And you know, I love in part two, you have 100 tactics for saving your community from gangs. And what's nice is you have a section on strategic planning, prevention, which you just mentioned, intervention, enforcement, reentry, which you mentioned as well, and then measurement. Let's talk about some of yours that really stand out uh, under the strategic planning. Well, it, you know, in prevention, again, um, it could be as something as as little and cost effective as, as putting the lights on on the ball field at night so young people can collectively have a place to oh, go. You know, one of the things that we've advocated in, in No Colors is for communities to really adopt community centers. In other words, instead of you know people in communities having to go to government service, actually taking a lot of the nonprofits and the government service uh, folks and taking them into the community. In other words, we need to stop the idea where uh, people are just waiting and depending on government in these individual communities to where we're actually sort of being, you know, community missionaries to go out and provide services right to the people. We think that could be done, you know, by just initiating community schools where you're actually using already government-owned buildings um, and, and you actually make them more community centers that would advocate prevention and intervention services, not only for just the youth but their families. We look at the average age of recruitment for gangs in America now is actually 9 to 10 years of age. Wow. Um, so we think that with the, with the prevention programs, including working with the boys and girls clubs, uh, working with your youth athletic teams, and schools, believe it or not, could do a, a great deal in each community by stepping up to the plate and allowing prevention programs to come in where kids can get, we, we call it the idea of positive messaging for children, mm-hmm. um, and that's exactly what we, we want in the prevention program. In the intervention side of it, we, we believe that, you know, uh, educators tell us that they spend about 90% of their day dealing with about 10% of the population, and we think that that 10% is the group that uh, really um, has the issues of probably not staying on task and and ending up in the gangs. We think that those kids ought to be really targeted at an earlier age than waiting till they commit some violent crime as a teenager. Uh, We think that once you understand that a child is really off task and is not doing exactly what they need to do, then we need to have wraparound intervention services. Some of the intervention services we talk about, believe it or not, are are actually, you know, continued um, education programs outside of the school themselves, an increase in mentoring Mm -hmm. where every child is identified and assigned a mentor. And we may even have to take a risk in communities and use former gang members uh, that that we feel very solidly can help to go out on the street and start street interventions. Oh, you know, I recently interviewed uh, Luis Rodriguez. Are you familiar with him? He was yeah. a—he's fabulous. 
Yeah. And he's written some incredible books about being involved in a gang. And, and he really wrote about the arts and writing. And that's what saved him. And I know one of the prevention measures you have is to uh, strengthen prevention with the arts. Absolutely. Well, I can tell you that uh, Shakespeare Los Angeles is one that oh. I would give up as a as a solid example. Oh, great. And I was, uh, you know, where they actually take, you know, one-act Shakespeare plays, and they, they uh, have gang members, actually people who have been identified early, um, you know, in gang in gang situations where we were trying to save the kids, they actually went and, and made those people involved in the production. Some were camera people. Some were actually working the light and sound board. They were actually training young people who had already made some poor decisions in their community. And I think that's really a key to intervention here. You know, one of the things that we believe is that once a young person joins a gang, that they always have this gang mentality, and they don't want to continue on a positive road. And that's very, very false. That's not true at all. Um, and that's where intervention comes in. We expanded the role of Shakespeare L.A., and I engineered a program in Richmond, Virginia, called the Richmond Grip Pro- Project, where we brought Shakespeare L.A. into Richmond. And I will tell you, the arts in and of itself saved a number of kids. I personally saw the power of the arts and what it can do to turn and to change kids uh, to the positive. Oh, definitely. You know, you also have some very interesting things. Uh, For example, gang exit centers, rescuing kids from gangs. Tell us about that. Well, again, it, it goes back to the traditional myth that, okay, now that, you know, you know, now that Johnny's joined a gang, they would just sort of need to write him off. It's as too a late, community. yeah. Mm-hmm. And and one of the things that we actually we actually even started taking tattoos off gang members and started lining them up with employees and job skills. Um, in That's some of these great. gang exit centers, they're identified, they're actually looked at as to where they want to go with their life. It's it's really interesting. It fits right into the aspect of reentry, which is part of um, part of the peer plan. Um, you know, a lot of people don't understand this, but when people get out, and I'm not talking about the serious violent criminals, but when people get out of, uh, you know, incarceration, a lot of times they're sent right back into mm-hmm. their community. Yeah. Uh, many of these folks have no life plan. They're not, no one is really working to see that they've developed the skills. Uh, we believe that part of that intervention in, in the gang exit process should be to really up our, our you know, GED programs, to ensure that when this individual comes back into our community that they have a plan of action instead of just existing in the same place with the same people that they were when they got in trouble. Part of this, a community can step up and really make an application. That is not the job of law enforcement. And that is why No Colors is very important because it moves beyond that thought process into a total community a plan to deal with it. Now, you're an ex-cop. So you used to be a cop. And did you feel like people were looking to you to solve the problem? Or you not you personally, but cops? Well, I did think that. I, yeah. And I still think that. I think that, mm-hmm. that law enforcement... Um, you know, is advocated in most communities to be the, the total, you know, owner of the gang problem and, and really the solution to the gang problem. But, you know, again, as you see the growth of this, when you talk about a 40% growth in two years in the United States, you can absolutely understand that we are not doing a good job of resting our way out of this. Um, and so as a police officer early on, I realized that, you know, um, in lieu of dealing with, again, hardened, violent criminals, a lot of these people were involved in some early drug situations and some situations where I, I really solidly believed that we could be turning some people around. And so that's really part of my career when I started advocating a solutions-based mentality to dealing with this problem. Uh, one of the things that I say when I speak publicly about this is, uh, you know, we know what gangs look like. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a given. It's been on television. It's, it's very commercially driven. So we know what gang members look like in communities. Now what do we do to reduce the problem? And that's been the nature of where my career has gone in the last decade. I was just very fortunate to team up with co-author Bud Ramey, and we together did a lot of research, and uh, No Colors brings, again, to uh, actually to the field exactly a lot of beliefs on, on these solutions. Yeah, well, it's a fantastic book. I, I just think it's so important. What What are some myths, do you think, about why kids get involved in gangs or, you know, that they necessarily come from, you know, a a certain type of family or do that? You know, what what would you say? Well, I think that that, that typically, um, traditionally, we did stereotype that. I mean, we we often said that in our larger communities, you know, we have a problem with with gangs, 
you know, in our projects or in, in, you know, our public housing areas. And I think that what the, again, as you saw the research from the FBI, I think that yeah. that now is realistically not the truth. So the type of the type of young people that are joining gangs in America has, has really vastly changed and probably within the last, you know, five years. And that is, is that some of the areas where we never believed that these we would have our kids coming from you know good communities i call them bedroom communities where you know it's sort of the sleeping quiet community where you don't anticipate these kind of issues those young people even from you know all walks of life now and all nationalities are seeking to to join the gang issue in america and and your your question of why they they seek that out there are a number of reasons you know, we, we have probably the largest latchkey population mm-hmm. of young people in the entire world in the United States. So a lot of kids are actually left to make their own decisions, you know, before, after school, and, and, a, and a lot of times even in the evenings. Um, and one of the things that we emphasize in No Colors is what parents can do to recognize that their kid's in trouble um, and that their kids are, are joining a gang and what to do if you find out they're in a gang. But kids join gangs for various reasons. Uh, one would be attention uh, that they may not be give, getting in other parts of their lives. And one concern that we really have that we need to start thinking about in communities is a lot of kids join gangs because of the influence of their peers who may already be in gangs. Mm. Um, we actually know that there are some communities in this country where if you're not a part of the gang, then you're really on the outside of the youth culture in that community. And there are some people that actually join gangs for their own protection. They feel like that if I don't join the gang, all my friends are there. And if I don't join the gang, then I, I will, I'm setting myself up to be a target in the community. Um, you know, as well as there are some young people now in communities that believe that they join gangs because it's a way to make a living. Our gangs have taken over our drug markets in our communities in America, and they're employing a lot of young people to move some of those drugs. So there are a number of reasons in each community why kids choose to do so. Are you a fan of the show The Wire? And if you are, do you think it's a realistic depiction? It's, it's, my husband loves that show, and I've watched it, but it's kind of hard to watch. You, do you know about it? Well, I do know about it, and I do think there's some aspects of that show that are actually right on target. Yeah. You know, obviously, you know, anytime you're going to have a, a produce event, you're going to have some sensationalism, but I think it's pretty much close to... to the core message and i think communities are you know as as on that show communities are struggling and they're struggling with this issue well i want to thank you so much for all the hard work that you've done this is a fantastic book again no colors a hundred ways to stop gangs from taking away our communities bobby kipper and bud ramey bobby thank you so much for being on it's your health this is such an important issue well, thank you for having us, and, and hopefully people can go out and, and take a look at our book, and we yeah, do what, hope that they'll they'll pay attention to the solution. Do you have a website? I do. It's www.solveviolence.com. That is the website for the National Center for the Prevention of Community Violence. Well, you, I just really admire you for the work that you do. You should feel really good about it. Well, thank you so much for having us. Thanks for listening. For more information, go to itsyourhealthnetwork.com.